Treatment Room Secrets, um, episode 21. Um, the last episode we celebrated with a few beers. Uh, so again, I prefaced the last episode explaining why we drank beers. Um, but now we're back to drinking coffee, green tea. Yep. Um, so please excuse us for last episode. Um, but we have a unique situation going on here for episode 21. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten. Ten, ten. ten needles um, in my arm. Um, and I'm here with Dr. Constance Bradley. So, um, Constance, thanks, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, Dr. Constance Bradley um, was here with us to teach an online course, two online courses, one on gua sha, mm -hmm. one on acupuncture, hence the uh, 10 needles inside my arm right now. Um, and... They're not just sitting in my arm for no reason because I did mention to Constance that I am suffering, have been suffering for almost a year from golfer's elbow, even though I do not golf. Um, and hopefully uh, this helps. And um, listening to you speak the last couple of days, uh, poking your brain the last couple of days, and I'll continue doing so in the next um, hour or so, um, has only instilled for me at least more confidence um in this practice um and the the common denominator for gua sha and um and acupuncture is that it they both stem from uh, traditional chinese medicine yes is that fair to say that's fair to say. um excellence um so can we start with that with the uh, chinese medicine um is it specific to china or is it um from the um the eastern part of the world i would I would say the latter. It's more historically, it would have been called oriental medicine. But since we don't really tend to refer things as oriental or from the Orient any longer, it's sort of now become Chinese medicine. But if you visit most any part of Asia, Eastern Asia, then you would see these traditional Chinese medicine modalities practiced. And I would say it's more Eastern medicine. And it's, you know, it's it comes with a lot of connotations yeah. um, in my from what I'm used to hearing pretty negative connotations when it comes to this type of thing mm -hmm. um, a lot of skepticism around it sure. again in the western world where Absolutely. we're from we're here in the US um, and even me personally I've I've never um, until very recently until like two months ago I have never seen a Chinese doctor Chinese healer um, just because I think like most people in our in our western world we we kind of taught to follow certain rules certain ways of thinking certain principles so you know if a if my elbow hurts then i you know i follow the the normal regular protocols mm -hmm. of stretching maybe some exercises maybe some rest there's the you know rice yes. um mm -hmm. acronym and those types of things and then maybe medications pills come in yep. and that type of thing again not saying what works what doesn't work but we're completely open-minded when it comes to little pills that we swallow absolutely. for some reason. Um, but to this type of thing, absolutely not. Maybe it's for our Western brains. It's hard to consume because even for me, when I, when um, even now looking at this, so for people that are only listening and not uh, seeing the video, um, I recommend seeing what's going on here. Um, but I have about six needles stuck around my elbow, the inner part of my elbow. Um, one, okay the forearm yeah, mm -hmm. yep, and then the uh, one of uh, three around my wrist and one in my pinky with the pinky feels uh the the weirdest yes um, <laughs> it's almost not fair that that's a region for acupuncture <laughs> that's, that's what i thought and i that, that was the only one i wasn't ready I for know, i know um, I got you but it um but it, yeah it does my arm does feel relaxed um it might seem like i'm not relaxed but i i, I place it in a weird position but it uh, at this point it's relaxed and it's been in me now for or they have the, the needles have been in me for for a uh, for quite a bit um do you think it's time to i think uh, it's time we can we can pull them out pull them out yeah. live here live um here. and it shouldn't hurt me right to yeah. pull them out yeah this is fun yeah Ooh. it's like a um What is the reaction usually that you get when, when removing the needles? Is it different than uh, when inserting the needles? Some areas of the body. So, for example, like, you know, yeah. tips of fingers and toes, like those are just going to produce sensation on both insertion and pulling them out. Yeah. Um, that's just kind of how it goes. But for the, you know, the majority of the needles, they're not going to hurt. 
<laughs> um, so tell me, how are you? Because your background is in, may I say, Western medicine? It is. It's uh, in Western science. Yeah. yeah. So, so tell me, like, for, how, right, tell me about there. your, am I good here? Yep. Yeah, no more needles. No more needles. Um, so I'm out. I'm free. You're so free. T- so t- t- tell right, me did about. I, did I fix you? <laughs> yeah, I'll let you know in a couple okay. of days. Um, but yeah, so tell me about your background in in medicine in general. Mm-hmm. Um, and we I'd love to dive into the transition maybe that you sure. made. Yeah. Um, but yeah, where did it begin for you in terms of medicine? Did yeah. you always know that you were going to head into I some did, sort of medicinal yeah. path? Mm-hmm. I went to the Air Force Academy. I attended the Air Force Academy for college with the intention of going to medical school, to becoming a, an MD, a medical doctor. And I, at, during the course of my college experience, I decided that I was much more interested in the theoretical aspect of science and medicine rather than, for example, the clinical application. Yeah. And I just decided that really what I really wanted to study were, uh, was theoretical science, theoretical biology. So that's what I ended up getting my, all of my um, doctorate degrees in theoretical biology. Yeah, and was it all through in the Air Force? All your studies took yeah. place. Mm-hmm. Yes, while well, I was active duty Air Force. Fantastic. And so, so to the ignorant person like mm-hmm. myself, what does what does it actually mean? Theoretical biology. Yeah, that's great. That's a great question. I get that <laughs> all the you, time because so it, it, no, so it's, not, it's not that stupid. No, to us. no, it's a really it's a really common question. So, if we can think of, about biology in yeah. itself as a subject of study, the central questions of biology aren't necessarily you know what is a cell, what is a gene. The yeah. the central questions of biology or science are, you know, how does this particular cell interact or what are the products that the cell produces or, you know, what are the me- the metabolic processes within the body? The theoretical questions, and we can ask the same question of, say, physics, are the meta questions. It's the defining of the biological entity or the biological object prior to it being a biological object that you can ask questions of. So we can say a theoretical biological question would be, what is a gene? What is a species? What does it mean for something to have an edge or boundary around it? So it's more of, you know, like how biological entities can be defined in the space that they operate in. So it's, it's, it's ascertaining what counts as a biological object. And then the subject of biology or biologists is then to just study this biological object without questioning really what the boundaries are around it. So the, the-, the theoretical part kind of establishes the boundaries of mm-hmm. biology. Correct. So studying all this, what are the boundaries of biology? <laughs> so you know, because when you say boundaries, mm-hmm. then my brain automatically goes to the beyond. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so now you establish what's inside mm-hmm. and what we can study mm-hmm. or what we, what we are studying. Sure. But what is everything else? Yeah, what, what is, that's a great question. I'll leave that th- to the theoretical physicists. <laughs> that's a little bit beyond what I was studying. My area was more focused on uh, species and genetics, especially like evolutionary species and evolutionary genetics. And it has to do with understanding how closely related species and genes are to each other. So, for example, I'll blow your mind on this one. Please. There is a species known as a lungfish. And so evolutionarily or genetically speaking, a lungfish is more closely genetically related to a cow than they are to any other species of fish. Yeah. And it's a very, I guess, common thought in the theoretical biology world that dinosaurs may not have quote unquote gone extinct in a major event. It's perhaps that dinosaurs evolved and turned into what we now modern day see as birds. Whoa. Yeah, whoa. <laughs> I also saw something in a Netflix documentary mm-hmm. that mushrooms are very genetically, oh. very closely re- um, related to humans. Yes, it's true. More than humans are to plants. I yes, think. yes. That's a that's another fantastic question. That's a definite theoretical biology question is hmm. where do mushrooms fit in all of this? And mushrooms are actually more closely genetically related to humans than they are to any other plant. And this is why um, fungal infections in humans are very, very difficult to treat. So, for example, where I'm from, Arizona, and there's a condition known as valley fever, which is a fungal infection in the lungs. And this condition is very hard to treat through typical Western medicine means because the medication required in order to target the fungus in the lungs also targets human cells. It's just by nature because human cells and fungal cells are so closely related. 
crazy stuff. I know, crazy. <laughs> so Chinese medicine, um, mm -hmm. where does it originate? I know there's a lot of criticism of, you know, um, modern day practices of Chinese medicine, which we can get into. But where, where does it start based on what we do know? Um, because, you know, some people argue that it, from what I've read at least, that it started hundred years ago. Uh, some argue that it started 3,000 years ago and some argue that it started way, way before that. Yeah. it's So that's a, I guess that's an open question that would again be like, what do you define as acupuncture? Mm -hmm. But a little bit like what I was talking about in the course that I would, the acupuncture course that I was teaching is that there are evidence in the Neolithic era, which was about you know, 10,000 BCE of therapeutic tattooing and body piercing. And when mummies are found from this time period, the mummies' bodies have these cross-shaped tattoos that are very close to what we'd consider to be classical acupuncture points. And acupuncture and Chinese medicine modalities have long been a folk remedy in the continent of Asia, long before China was ever unified into one country. But then... When, you know, because China progressed, um, went up and down over mm -hmm. the years and then, yep. you know, it is what it is now. Mm -hmm. um, around the, ta the time of, um, you know, Mao, when yes. Mao was in power. Yes. Also then a lot of changes occurred. A lot of changes occurred. The medicinal occurred. structure of the country. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. so do you know how, like, do you have any knowledge on how that affected the development of what we know as Chinese medicine? Yeah, there was, during the Cultural Revolution, so prior to the Cultural Revolution, there was, it was considered just the practice of Chinese medicine. And it had this big tie-in to ancient Chinese cosmology and within this Taoist philosophical tradition. When Mao came into power, his idea was he wanted to create, you know, basically barefoot doctors or everyone had this, he wanted everyone to have knowledge of Chinese medicine. So it became systematized and what is, is what we now know, know as TCM or traditional Chinese medicine. And that is where, you know, everything was put together into very systematized textbooks that could be repeated and, you know, taught in schools so that this knowledge there, you know, therefore became, it wasn't secretive or magical knowledge that was like tied to cosmos. It became more straightforward that anyone basically could like read the book and kind of understand it. But it did lose a little bit of this, you know, cosmological tie to the universe with it. And, you know, if we really look at historical Chinese medicine and understanding the body and how traditional the, the, the Chinese medicine view, you know, the before the cultural revolution, then we really see that, you know, we have lost quite a bit. And so I think that, you know, for myself, I've, I've always really enjoyed studying that, you know, that pre Mao version of Chinese medicine, because you get a really good sense in like, where did this actually come from? And you get a nice picture of, of how to apply these modalities. So what is it all based on? Uh, Cause you're saying like you get a better idea of where mm -hmm. it came from and how to apply it. Then what is the, again, in, you know, in simple terms for yeah, me. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so what, what does it, where does it stem from? Um, and how, how did people like figure out um, where to apply all these pressure points or acupuncture points? Um, in the body. Yeah, it came from looking at the universe as a correlation between yin and yang. And so we, I talked about this a little bit in my course that, you know, really, according to Taoist philosophy, everything can be viewed through the lens of correspondences being some being yin and some being yang. And these correspondences support each other and they're always relative. So if you are working, you know, as a Taoist philosopher, you know, shady side of the hill is the yin side. The sunny side of the hill is the yang side. And that what we see as the macrocosm in the universe can be applied to the microcosm of the body. So then you can see the body as a system of correspondences of yin or yang, you know, with yang being heat, inflammation, things going upwards, things, you know, movement, and then yin being coolness, moistness, moving downward, stagnation. So that's where it originally started to become, you know, this Taoist philosophy, this Taoist cosmology being applied to the body in terms of 
wh- who actually came up with the acupuncture points and location, no one actually knows. Um, I always joke with my clients that, you know, how would you like to be the first person? You know, hey, come here. I, I think I figured something out. I'm going to I'm gonna poke you with a stone and see if it works. So no one actually knows like who or how it was come up with the very first original acupuncture areas. But it is situated within the idea of yin and yang correspondences in the body. What I like about it, at least theoretically from what, you know, listening to you and mm-hmm. reading about um, just w- tr- the, the umbrella term of traditional Chinese medicine um, is looking at the body as one connected organism mm-hmm. and not broken down into little pieces. Right. Um, and also number two is the preventative measures that yes. come with it. Um, that is, you know, is, is, as you mentioned, a main focus when it comes to Chinese medicine. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there was also the fact that it's, you know, it's it's there to also res- restore balance um, mm-hmm. to some degree um, in the body. Um, whereas, you know, if 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 I'm following traditional Western medicine, um, if nothing is specifically wrong with me, if my elbow pain is not there and my neck doesn't hurt and my mm-hmm. back doesn't hurt, then you know I feel that everything is fine. Sure. Um, and then you know, but we have no idea what's going on inside us. And I think also. A lot of people that are maybe less connected to their bodies, maybe people that don't move as much, maybe mm-hmm. people that did not um, suffer certain injuries or diseases in their past, maybe don't even like know to tell sometimes when something is off sure. um, inside their bodies. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's very easy to just continue living while things develop inside you. And we also, we know that as humans, we get used to certain things yeah. very easily. We're very... Yeah. Um, compatible to really any situation Mm -hmm. Um, like Michael here eating grapes for 30 days in a row Um, (laughs) things like that can get pretty pretty easy right once you're used to doing it whatever it is Um, so so I like that fact and I um, and I haven't said this to many people um, but I I did mention it to you Mm because I thought um, you'd like to hear it that I I did go and see a Chinese healer for the first time in my life and it was a you know it was a lovely experience again just from the sense that I spent 60 minutes with the person, um, not 12 minutes or four minutes. Sometimes Um, they asked about my eating habits, my sleeping habits, Mm -hmm. my, um, you know, my relationships with my family, with my friends, um, which was really, um, it was nice to see. I I wasn't even ready for it. I showed up, was, I got a smack in the face uh, figuratively because I wasn't ready to answer these questions and I wasn't ready to, um, to, I didn't think so. I, I thought that I'd be sitting down on a bed or laying on a bed and, you know, so getting maybe some acupuncture some or uh, <laughs> some, maybe some other method. Um, mm. But that was not the case. And um, I found that uh, challenging um, mentally because, mm. again, I wasn't ready for it. Sure. Um, and I find myself pretty open-minded in comparison to the average person maybe in the Western world. Um, so I'm assuming a lot of people are just not, you know, just have maybe no ability or no known ability to connect um, with Chinese medicine. Do you do you feel that? Like, do you feel like you're, you know, a stranger um, in this? In, in, you know, because you're a, you know, you're practicing these um, these modalities in the U.S. Absolutely, I will say, acupuncture has come a long way in the U.S. I first received acupuncture probably in like 2009, and at that point in time, I ha- I was trying to recover from an injury, and I had to drive 90 minutes to find an acupuncturist. And I had no idea what it was. I'd never heard. I thought it was something they did in movies maybe or like, you know, this is what hippies do or, you know, I had no idea. And now I would say the majority of people I know have at least heard of acupuncture, if not tried it. So I will say that we've come quite a long way just yeah. in a short period of time, especially in this country. So is that your first, 2009 was the first mm-hmm. time that you received acupuncture? Yes. Um, mm-hmm. And is, was that your introduction that personally my, to Chinese medicine? Yes, it was. So I hear I am in this Western science background and then I ended up having a sports injury, a triathlon injury and Western medicine just, you know, they're like, you need knee surgery, but you're too young to have the knee surgery. So we can't do the surgery. So here's a bunch of pills and prescriptions. Don't just don't run anymore. Just, and then, yeah. and then what, what was the injury? Oh, so I, well, I was doing, I was a triathlete and I ended up tearing some cartilage out of my knee and I tore a tendon in my hip. Yeah. So, so knee and hip. Mm-hmm. Um, what was the knee as cartilage you mentioned? Mm-hmm. Is that, so is that meniscus? It was patellar cartilage. Mm. Yeah. 
Interesting. And now? And by now, the way? yeah. Because <laughs> what with 14 years later? Yeah. Um, so, so how is your knee? How is your great. head? It's <laughs> great. I've never had surgery. And, you know, cart- no cartilage is no cartilage. And I understand that, you know, I have to use acupuncture and I have to use my modalities to keep things from, to keep pain from returning. But I would say 99% of the time I have no pain and I have you full- treat You treat yourself. I treat myself. I'm my own, I'm my own acupuncturist. <laughs> That's a perk, right? It's a perk of the job, right? I don't have yeah. to drive to find someone. Yeah. yeah. And also anecdotal evidence that you wouldn't be wasting your time on yourself. That's- I'm assuming. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, but the injury, so, you know, being a triathlete in mm-hmm. general, it's pretty intense. It's um, pretty intense. How did you get into uh, running triathlon or running, competing in triathlons? Yeah. That's participating a, it's in a triath- funny story. I, I was always a runner. I was a runner in college and just on my own, just, you know, like on the cross country team, you yeah. know, never like a long distance runner. And I was watching television one day. So were you on the cross country team? I was on the cross country team. Yes. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, and cross, it's, uh, was it 10 Ks? It's, t- it's a 10 K. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So 10K had been the farthest I'd ever run ever. What's and, your best uh, 10K time? Oh, I'm ashamed to admit. I don't know. It's probably in the, the 50 minute realm or somewhere like that. It's not bad. <laughs> yeah. That was not my distance. That was not my best distance. Um, I was watching TV and I saw they were televising an Ironman triathlon. And these people look terrible. They're miserable. They're dragging themselves across the finish line. And I was mesmerized. I thought, I need to do one yeah. of these. I can't live any longer without doing one of these. So that's how I turned into a triathlete. I, I got a swim coach. I got a cycling coach. And within the next year, I had entered my first Ironman. And I was hooked after that. That's all I wanted oh, to so do. So you actually did, did an Ironman. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. Uh, which is, it's longer than a triathlon, right? It's, it's a triathlon. It's a two and a half mile swim. It's a hundred mile, a hundred twelve mile bike ride, and then it's a full marathon. But is a um, I thought I thought maybe I'm wrong, but a traditional triathlon is shorter distances. Correct. That's okay. a, that would be what's called an Olympic distance triathlon. I see. Mm-hmm. I see. I see. Okay. So you went straight into the. I was uh, straight into the long event. course. <laughs> wow. So how long since you watched that? Um, that was a TV commercial. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> how long until you actually competed in your first? It was one? a year. It was a year later. Wow. Um, yeah. And have you ever cycled, swam before? Before that. No. <laughs> yeah, and it's open water, right? It's so, open water. Wow, it's yeah. kind of scary. <laughs> yeah, right. And yeah. yeah, and was it uh, enjoyable? I know it's you no, know, it's a weird word to say because you probably suffered every moment through it. But, yeah, it's a girl um, fest. Yeah, but yeah, but was it a was it a you know a meaningful experience? Oh too? yeah, it was. Yeah? The very next day, I signed up for my for my next wow. one. Wow, and yeah. how many have you done? Um, I've done two. I did two Ironman. Do you have the tattoo? I do. <laughs> I do. <laughs> You have to get the tattoo. You have to get the tattoo. <laughs> like, or, you know. They have a booth set up at the finish line, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, that's amazing. But not you haven't done. Uh, did you get? Did you get injured after? I got that injured after one? the second one. Mm. Mm-hmm. I see. And was yeah. the what was what part was the uh, most enjoyable for you out of the three? Was it the running? You know, I'm a runner. Yeah, so yeah. I, I like the running. Yeah, I was in in my mind. I, I always think about it, and I I I, I, th- I would like to believe that cycling would be. Um, yeah. Why am I wrong? Completely? Well, so I'm I'm very short. I'm very mm. petite person. So for me, cycling is challenging because my bike was configured to be. You know, I'm, I'm small, so my my the diameter of my cycling tires or my wheels are smaller than everyone else's. So it takes twice the effort for me to push a bike, for example, up or down a hill. I, I don't see. weigh very much, so I don't have the same momentum going down. Yeah. yeah so. um, and running though, don't do you have a disadvantage running being petite? Um, I never felt a disadvantage. I always finish quite well running. Yeah. yeah. But swimming, same. I'm not, I'm not, I don't have a swimmer's body, you know, and swimming, like, you know, people just beat you up in the swim. They kick you and they flail and it's all legal. And it's like, why, why, why am I getting kicked? <laughs> Get me on the water. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I heard about that. Yeah. That's, that's crazy. Do you it's miss cr- it? Yeah, I do miss it sometimes, but you know, I'm now, I'm now really into yoga and I teach yoga and I, I practice a lot of yoga. So I think that that's, you know, as I've sort of aged out of that, like fierce competition and now I'm really into more of the these yin modalities of yoga. <laughs> yeah. So what do you think is just overworking that damaged your hip and your... Oh, for and your sure. Neck? And tell me, like knowing what you know now, um, could you have approached things differently to oh, prevent absolutely. these injuries? Oh, absolutely. But while maintaining the same uh, distances and the same competitions? I think so. Yeah. You know, I was, I was in my 20s and I thought that stretching and yoga, those were boring things. There was no way that I was going to waste time doing that when I could actually be out on the run or in the, in the pool. So 
I just didn't ever do it. But hindsight being 2020 as it is, I would, if I had to approach that differently now, I would really spend a lot of time with flexibility, with stretching, with yoga, because not only does it give you the physical benefit of lengthening your muscles and providing suppleness to your muscles, as well as the recovery benefit, it's such a nice mind body connection. And so much of sport, especially endurance sport is a mental game that I just felt like I would have had such an advantage if I had really taken the time to in- incorporate that into my training. That mental game that you're talking about, mm. um, like, do you remember having conversations with yourself during the competition? Oh my gosh. During the yeah. Ironman? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what, what got you through it? What was your reason for finishing? Well, I just wanted to do it. I just wanted to do it for myself. And I just thought, you know, if I, I can dig deep, I can do this. I can, I can finish. And you know, you're not allowed to listen to music. You don't, you can't have headphones. It's, yeah. Ill, it's illegal. So I would just, I'd memorize poetry. I'd memorize songs. I'd memorize things that I could just go to that were sort of my happy place. And did you have a go-to uh, poem <laughs> that, you, that you can even, that I'll ask you to recite? I don't know if I remember yeah. any of the poetry. <laughs> I do remember listening to a lot of Tori Amos and her songs are like poetry. So I would, I would memorize her songs and that was kind of nice. And I'm remember. embarrassed. I don't know um, who that is. You don't know who Tori Amos is? No, I don't. Oh, she's a I'll, fantastic piano player, um, singer, songwriter. Um, but, but I will, uh, ch- I'll check her out. Yeah, she's great. I'll check her out. And then so, so you faced these injuries. Mm-hmm. Um, you were pretty disappointed, I'm assuming, when oh, uh, you yeah. went to the doctors and they told you that you're, you're done. I was crushed. <laughs> like, I thought my life was over. You know, I went from training 20, 25 hours a week just on my own as well as I coached the Air Force triathlon team. So I was very... And what, so was that Olympic um, distance? Yes, yes college distance. And then a couple of times a year, we would have some students who wanted to attend an Ironman on their own, but that wasn't like a school sanctioned event. So it was the Olympic distance. So, so how was that coaching um, these individuals who are competing in these pretty intense um, yeah, environments? Yeah, it's, it's, well, you know, back then triathlon really wasn't mainstream as it is now. So... You were just taking someone kind of like me who had never swam before, maybe, you know, or maybe you were taking someone who really excelled at one of the three and then trying to teach them the other two and to learn to balance that out. That was like a really interesting, interesting way of of introducing someone to a sport. But if you have, if you're, if you're brave enough to compete in one of those or practice one of those and you already, you possess the most important um, ingredient, the mental illness of, uh, (laughs) of Practicing an endurance uh, yeah. this is sport. Um, so, but but working with these individuals, like, I mean, because you were, were you teaching them as well, or was before I was you're, teaching. So yes, you're so teaching. You're mm-hmm. a coach, and you're doing these extra 20, mm-hmm. 25 hours of training. Yes. So, did you always like? Do you enjoy teaching? Did you always have a connection to coaching, teaching? Yes, I love to teach. I'm super passionate about teaching. Yeah, like that's always been like one of the things that I feel like it's like my zone of excellence. I really excel at sharing knowledge with other people. And even now, let's say, um, you know, because I can see, tell me if I'm wrong, but in, in having the knowledge that you have when it comes to Chinese medicine, mm-hmm. um, do you try and pass on that information to maybe colleagues or professionals out there that um, that maybe are just unaware of certain things that you know? Or do you, you know, keep quiet and keep it to yourself and just practice and keep developing personally? Well, I'm always looking to develop personally. I think that's really important. And because Chinese medicine is so old, there's always something new that you can pick up, something new to learn. Even if you pick up the same book that you've read 10 times before, there's always something new that you can pick up. And I always like to be developing my own knowledge. And I'm happy to share with any colleague, anyone who asks me, you know, my, some of my very best friends are people who I went to acupuncture school with. And we're always sharing information with each other. Hey, how would you treat this? Or how would you, you know, I had this person come in today and have you seen this before? So it's really, I think, important to be collegial and to really share with people because that's what makes forward progress in the profession. So what made you, made you take the jump and um, after being, you know, crushed by the doctors oh, yeah. and telling you that you won't <laughs> um, be able to run? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. What made you take that leap? How did that happen? It was it was 100 percent by chance. Truly, I was getting a massage and the massage therapist who I didn't know at all. Um, you know, she was listening to me go on and on about <laughs> I'm injured and I can't run anymore. And, you know, she's probably tired of me talking. She was like, hey, have you ever tried acupuncture or yoga? 
And I mean, she might as well have said like, hey, have you ever tried to eat moon rocks before? Because <laughs> I was like, no, I've never. I mean, I really thought that acupuncture was just something from the movies and yoga. Yeah. I had never, ever heard of yoga. Also for, because I feel like um, in different scales maybe, but similar to you, I always underestimated yoga because yeah. from a distance it looks it looks, it looks easy, easy when you compare it to someone who's running <laughs> yeah. you know it looks um fun you're on a mat you don't really move around you mm -hmm. hold positions um yeah. so so did you underestimate it as well oh my goodness my very first yoga class <laughs> i walked in i'm not wearing yoga clothes i had no idea that what you that yoga clothes where you have a whole thing of yoga clothes i was wearing running now clothes. everyone's wearing yoga clothes right? yes i have on like my running shorts and a cotton t-shirt and i attended a hot yoga class and within five minutes, I was down for the count. I was on the mat. I was sweating. I was probably in tears. <laughs> it's like, I'm an Ironman athlete. Like, this shouldn't be this hard. But it was, it was hard. <laughs> it's hard work. <laughs> yeah, crazy. So you're with the massage therapist. You're, yeah. You're, you're complaining about your situation. Oh, yes. yep. She said, go to yoga, go to acupuncture. And I thought, I'll try anything at this point. I literally, I was that desperate. And now being on the practitioner side of that, I see myself walk in through my door you know, several times a week, mm -hmm. that desperate person who's never really tried this, never heard of it. And that those are always my favorite people to work with because I can really see myself in that person. And it's always a pleasure to help them with their injury. So yeah, I, I drove myself 90 minutes to the closest acupuncturist and I delivered myself on her doorstep broken and I said, fix my knee, fix, just fix me. I said, I, and were you in pain back then? I was in so much pain. And Both hip and knee? Oh yeah. And what I told her is like, I just want to walk without limping. Like I, I was limping around and I said, if you can just help me walk normally again, like I don't even care about running at this point, like just help me walk. And she was like, sure. So, you know, similar to like what your experience was like for 60 minutes, she just talked to me and, you know, she wanted to know about my sleep and my digestion. And, you know, I had really terrible acne at that point in time. And she's like, tell me about your skin. And, all these things. And I, at first I was kind of annoyed. I was like, is she listening? Like my knee and like, I, I'm in pain. That's how I felt too. Yeah. I was like, why is, it, why is she listening to me? Yeah. But then I realized sort of after I had left the treatment, I was like, no, she was, she was actually really listening to me. And the whole drive home, I thought after all these doctor's appointments who I've been to, and I had been to many for orthopedic, I had been to specialist for digestive. I had been to specialists for my skin. I had seen so many specialists and not a single person had bothered to say, well, how is your sleep or how is your stress or how, you know, how are you, how's your relationship with your family? How, you know, how are you feeling? You know, things like that. Just how are you? How are you? <laughs> and I felt like for the first time with this acupuncturist, she saw me as a total holistic unit rather than just a series of discrete systems. And she was able to sort of pull the thread together for me and say, well, look, I know why your skin is so bad. It's because your digestive system is so bad. And that's because, you know, you drink 12 Diet Cokes a day and you have terrible dietary habits. And, you know, no one had ever told me, like, you should clean up your diet and start to consider eating a little bit better. It's like, oh, OK. I, you know, I had never, that was brand new information to yeah, me. Yeah, because Diet Cokes is fine <laughs> because it's zero calories. Zero calories. Fine. Zero calories. Yeah. As many as you want. And I did have as many as I wanted to. <laughs> and, you know, truly, you know, that, and she was like, look, like you have this, you know, recalcitrant knee and you know injuries, things like that. But also you have these other imbalances in your body because you have these like, you know, biomechanical things that we could help straighten out overall. Right. It was the first time that, you know, someone pointed out that, you know, this could have a lot to do with, you know, the way that your feet contact the ground that perhaps, you know, the you need, to, you need to start to think about your gait and your stance and your posture maybe a little bit differently. So I saw this acupuncturist for a year enrolled in yoga and I did everything the acupuncturist told me. I changed my diet. I stopped drinking Diet Coke, which was terrible for, for a while, but now it's great. And I mean, really, I, I was able to go from the state of not being able to walk without limping to restoring complete functionality. By the end of a year, I could run again. I could ride my bike. Oh. I could do everything that I wanted to do. And I wasn't taking any prescriptions. And I wasn't, you know, I wasn't, I never needed surgery. 
So I did pretty much the opposite of everything that my Western physicians had advised. And that's not always the right thing to do. I'm not always saying like, you know, go against the advice of your yeah. doctor because that's not always the right thing. But in my case, I just wasn't getting the help that I needed. And I was able to find the help that, that made me really feel like someone was taking care of my total body wellness. What surgery did they say you were too young to get? Knee replacement. Oof. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so yeah. So lucky, lucky they. Lucky, lucky. lucky they said you were too young yes. to get it as yes. well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and like, did you get back to running after that? After a year, you were running. You said. But I was did you running. Continue running for I didn't a while? really continue running at this point. I had really fallen in love with yoga, mm. and I was that person. That were you going consistently? I was for going that year? consistently. Mm-hmm. I was there every, pretty much every single day. And I knew that at the end of doing, you know, all of this for a year, I wanted to to go to, to yoga teacher training. I wanted to teach yoga and I just really fell in love with that. So that's where I've decided to sort of invest my time these days is, is that. And I want to ask you about yoga again. Uh, yeah. The listeners have heard me speak about yoga many times. I'll <laughs> ask many um, beginners, amateurish questions. Sure. Uh, but you went to, um, so you went to teacher's training. So it was mm-hmm. the teacher's training you went to, was that the Bikram yoga? That was Bikram yoga. Mm-hmm. Um, which again, we know back then was ginormous, was all over the place. Yes. No matter what city you were in the world, you saw Bikram yoga signs. Everywhere. Mm-hmm. Everywhere. Um, my exposure to Bikram was seeing signs everywhere and then, watching that Netflix documentary, oh, which yes. we also mentioned um, yes. off air, which is also, again, I don't know if controversial is the word, but just um, um, eye-opening and uh, sure. scary at times yeah. as well. Um, but also very compelling and impressive yeah. what happened there yeah. um, in many ways. Um, so what made you want to make that jump? Because, again, to me, um, if we put away all the controversial, controversial parts mm-hmm. of the story um, and focus on the practice itself... Um, just that alone um, seems pretty scary. Maybe you're attracted to scary things cause, cause, <laughs> because an, scary Iron, things. an Iron Man seems Iron also Man's pretty scary, scary to commit yeah. to something like that. And mm-hmm. what the Bikram program was it nine weeks? Nine you weeks. Said? Mm-hmm. Nine weeks um, where it was every day you're practicing? Twice a day, every day. Every day, twice a day for yes. nine weeks. Yes, except you get one day off a week. Yes. Uh, and um, <laughs> so even that's a commitment. That's it's a scary commitment. one to, uh, yeah. to uh, jump into. Mm-hmm. Um, so do you remember yourself like day one, day two, what your thoughts were? Like, did you... Or did you buy into it immediately or did it take you time to get used to this new environment you were in? Oh, no, I was super excited. I was yeah. super excited to be there. And I think my decision to go there was really similar to my decision to want to attend Chinese medicine school is it had worked for me. You know, yoga had worked for me. It had helped me to rehabilitate at a time when I couldn't go out for a run. And I was being told just, you know, don't run, don't do any physical activity at all. And yoga really helped me, you know, you, you get on your mat. And even though I couldn't do very many things to begin with, you start to put your mind into your body and you start to, you know, really, you have to sit with that and you have to sit with your own discomfort. And that was a different thing that I'd ever done before. And I started to, I started to enjoy it. And I wanted to go to yoga teacher training because A, I wanted to learn more about yoga. And then B, I also wanted to become a teacher because I wanted to share that with other people. So when I showed up there, I was ready to go. I was so excited. I, Did you know anyone there? I didn't know anyone there. Yeah. And it's people from all over the world. Uh, my training had 400 people and it's people from everywhere. Yeah. And you're practicing, it was a specific sequence, right? Of yeah, 26, the, the Bikram 26. 26 poses. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's where you practice twice a day, twice every a day, day yeah. or six times a week. 400 um, people in a hotel ballroom. <laughs> it's crazy, yeah. yeah. Um, and again, the scenes that anyone can see on YouTube are, are pretty wild because it's pretty yeah. intense. Not oh, what yeah. people think as the the regular yoga session that you see down the, no. down the you know, main, main street, wherever you live. No. Um, pretty intense. Um, Very intense. And... Obviously, uh, Mr. Bikram, yes. I, 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 I don't know, I won't attempt to pronounce his full name, um, <laughs> but a very um, strict uh, teacher, like, set in his ways, sure. um, and, yes. but something very unique about him is pushing people to their, uh, to their max capacity. Oh, yes. Um, oh, and, yeah. Or testing, testing people's capacity to, mm. um, to, to really push Yes, to push. To push. Yeah. Um, and did you feel that? Were you pushed? I felt very pushed. Yeah. I mean, it's you're tired and you're, you're just doing this yoga twice a day and then you're learning classroom at the same time. 
and yeah, you do feel pushed and it's hot. I mean, these classes are very, they're very warm. And most of the time you're just like, like literally warm in, in a hot very, room. Oh, it's a yeah. hot room. Yeah. You're just like, I just want to sit down. I just, I literally just want to sit down. I just don't think I can do this anymore. And for me, I started to really learn what's the difference between pain, pain, just being information or pain or discomfort, you know, just I, I'm I, like if I if I was really ill, right? Like I yeah. know I need to sit down. I know I need to take care of myself. Versus like, okay, I think I can push through this a little bit longer. And it's nice to know, like you start to again the edges and boundaries of things. You start to discern where your edges and boundaries are. You know, like okay, I think I can work through this. Or you're like, no, today today's not my day. My best thing that I can do to take care of myself is to is to take a knee and have some water. Do you know how to articulate that difference um, <laughs> of what's going on? Because I, um, because it's a tough one to figure out yeah, as an individual. It's yeah. very, and without testing your limits, yes. um, it's very difficult to know what the limits are. Yeah. Uh, but testing the limits is scary, like we yeah, mentioned. Yeah, scary. Um, but can also be dangerous. Uh, <laughs> it can be dangerous. People. It can um, be dangerous. So I feel like like only if you know, if you run to a point where you're, where you're throwing up or if you run to a point where you're dizzy or you run to a point where you're where you pass out mm -hmm. only then you know what okay, point it is <laughs> when you when you pass out right. um so it's so it's almost like it's it is a trial and error totally um which is again you know also i laugh about it with um, certain people who can understand me mm -hmm. um is that there is something tempting about wanting to find out what that point is right um but do you know how to articulate for you what that point, how do you know now based on what, what you've been through? A, again, just that is a lot. And I'm sure yeah. you've been through many more things in your life, which in, in, in different um, um, in different capacities, but just that training um, and just the Ironmans is pretty crazy. Yeah, it, it is pretty crazy. I know when I look at it now. In a good way. I'm in a saying. good way. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm yeah, jealous. Yeah. I'm jealous <laughs> of you for both. Hey, there's still Ironmans to be, to be ran. So <laughs> maybe in the future, maybe in the future. I haven't, I haven't committed to anything. <laughs> um, one of my favorite yoga teachers I've had over the years, he was very fond of saying pain is information. That's all. Pain is just information. It's not good and it's not bad. And I think for me, that was really helpful because I used to conceive of pain or discomfort as negative. As soon as I start to feel discomfort, as soon as something starts to feel painful, as soon as I start to feel sick, that's bad. That's really bad. And in conceiving of that, it's just informational. So it's just data. So what, what am I going to do with that data today? And my body, respecting that my body is different on any given moment, on any given day, then it's just how is that data going to feed into my reaction on any given day? So I guess like that's how I help discern that line of, you know, is this, is this just discomfort? Am I just, you know, like I just need to push a little bit harder or is it time to pull it back? And I think that comes with experience. And also knowing the knowing the inner spaces of your mind, getting really comfortable with being in your own mind and sort of getting really to know yourself really well helps with that as well. And you mentioned that you also went to a teacher's training with um, one of Bikram's colleagues. Yes. Or that they, they both from the same school of yes. practice. Mm -hmm. um, and that was very different, you mentioned. Is it completely and, different? And was it a full teacher's training as yes. well? Mm -hmm. it was also a full nine teacher, weeks? Five weeks. Five weeks, okay. Yes, it was five weeks. It was just a very different experience. So if if Bikram is, you know, the celebrity yogi and, you know, very Hollywood, very splashy, you know, he's very young, you know, then his, his colleague, Tony Sanchez, you know, he's not the Hollywood yogi. He's very private. He's very quiet. He's very yin. And that experience was much more, you know, teaching you how to take care of yourself. It was very much deep dive into meditation, to nutrition, to eating well, to, um, you know, you have the, the respectful practice of yoga, not in a hot room. So you learn how to do yoga, you know, just in like a, you know, an 80 degree room, not in a 105 degree room. So was it that hot? The Bikram is in 105 degrees? Mm -hmm. 105 degrees. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so what do you think about that now that you, you teach yoga, you practice yoga, mm -hmm. like te the temperature, what is the effect of the temperature? Why do we play with the numbers of the temperature? What's the difference between being in an 80 um, degree room to 105, 105 degree room? The idea behind the hot yoga, the 105 degree room, scientifically speaking, is that, you know, when you're subjected to that, your body's subjected to that, your body releases heat shock proteins, which are really 
beneficial in terms of antioxidant and they produce like a beneficial stress load on the body up to a certain point. You know, you don't want to go too much too long with that because then you can start to fatigue and attack the adrenal system. You know, it also produces a lot of sweat, you know, which is nice because you can really start to feel, you know, a release from the sweat. The the more the room temperature yoga, more of this 80, 85 degree yoga, that comes again from a very traditional view of yoga where, you know, you don't need additional heat. You can learn very specific breathing techniques that that produce the heat from the inside out. And so it's a sort of a different way of heating up the body. So is there less of an emphasis on breathing when it comes to uh, Bikram? There is definitely an emphasis on breathing. It's just a different type of breathing. You're not going to be in a hot room doing really deep um, heat producing breath. You're actually going to be doing a little bit more shallow, more cooling breath to release heat from the body. What's the difference? <laughs> if you don't mind. Explaining. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, like, what's a uh, cooling breath? Yeah, so it's just like a more shallow. It's a it's a shallower breath. Yeah. Um, in in the Bikram world, it's there. People are very fond of saying it's eighty twenty breathing. So you fill up your hundred percent of your lungs, but you hold eighty percent of the air, and you continue to inhale and exhale the twenty percent. In the other types of yoga, you would use something that's called a ujjayi breath which is really taking the breath in and sending it all the way down through the body and then using engaging like your bandhas and your muscles of your core to sort of lock that breath in and they were to use that to produce the heat of your body. And is it Tony Sanchez is the Tony Sanchez, yes. The teacher. Yeah. Um so do you if you had to uh, which one did you enjoy more or was which one helped you more Pick your favorite as an child. individual <laughs> as a, no but as an individual like cuz now now you're a yoga mm -hmm. instructor um yes. like did any of them influence you and the way you teach and the way you practice more? I would say they are both influential in different ways. When you're at Bikram's teacher training, you you Bikram is not the only teacher who you encounter. You encounter many other teachers from all over the world. And so you get a chance to sort of see how the Bikram yoga and philosophy has been implemented through other teachers. And that was sort of an interesting experience. And you know, Bikram has a very particular way of doing things. So that teaches you, I think for me, it taught me, you know, more of this is a discipline structure. You're working with inside a structure in order to accomplish a particular goal. Tony's methodology of teaching is a little bit more of learning to explore the yoga on your own. And Tony has a big emphasis on self and home practice. And in fact, Tony's, one of his main philosophies that he kept saying over and over again was that you should go home after my teacher training and just teach yourself for a solid several months. Don't teach anyone else. Just teach yourself until you feel like you have really incorporated these teachings into your own body. And then you can go out and teach other people. So it's just a different philosophies, but I think they're both really helpful. They definitely, I, I draw on them both every time that I teach. How do you define yourself as a teacher? Oh, I don't know. That's a good, my, my, my husband's sitting right there. He takes my class <laughs> regularly he'd probably know better um i would like to say that i um um i'm firm but gentle i i like to teach people anatomy and alignment and i really like to make sure that people are doing postures or approaching yoga with anatomical correctness because i think that comes from the physical way of aligning your body and restoring that physical health in the body you know so it's not just throwing yourself somewhere and i also like to encourage my students to make that mind body connection so just like you're not throwing yourself into a posture with disregard for alignment you're also not throwing yourself into a posture without disregard for your breath and where your mind is and so I really think that I, I like to give people some space to explore that mind-body connection, but I do like to make sure that everyone is aware of and understands why we're trying to achieve, you know, a certain alignment, why we do things a certain way in, in yoga. Is there a way to teach alignment to individuals without putting them in a yoga studio? I think so. Without testing them? How? I don't. I mean, I don't know. Because That's a no, question. No one ever taught me the correct alignment or mm -hmm. any sort of alignment for example you know any even walking up the stairs 99 percent of people walk up the stairs without any consideration um sure for aligning their body for using their core for tightening their certain muscles for you know um just 
almost being ready for impact. Yeah. That's why I, that's why I try and like, um, almost like, uh, collecting, collecting myself mm-hmm. so I can be in a firm and, you know, a stable aligned position before performing an activity. And I never thought about that. Um, I always thought about it in the sense of if I am about to, you know, perform a step up in the gym, mm-hmm. then I'm focusing on my leg, but not on my ribs, not on my core, right. not on my um, pelvic muscles, nothing like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and I, and I think it's so it's so useful because ever since I'm more aware of it, and I've tried to practice it on a daily basis again mm-hmm. even things like getting out of bed or walking down the stairs right um my back hurts way 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 less my hips sure, hurt less my yeah. knees hurt. everything hurts less when i'm just more conscious of w- the actions that i'm taking and absolutely that's what and i think that we also we even people that work out most of the movements that we make are not working out in oh, the gym absolutely. movements they're just yeah. normal things that we do on a daily basis cooking for example sure um cooking you know every time not that i wash the dishes that often but when i do wash the dishes my back always used to hurt yeah because i'm in an awkward <laughs> position so mm-hmm. i just in the last few months i've been doing it in just a way more aligned thing, yeah. and it's change the way I wash the dishes yeah. and it's um, less painful for oh, my I'm back. Sure. I'm um, sure. So small things like that. So what is your way to try and get people to try and understand that? Well, when I see acupuncture clients, I am able to, you know, I work with people one-on-one and, you know, I spend time, I watch people walk. I, you know, sit people in chairs and I ask them to think about engaging particular parts of their body. And I try to encourage them to put their mind in their body and focus on their proprioception, focus on their core. You know, so there's a way, I think, to to teach this skill, which it is a skill. And it's I think it's mindfulness. Well, you don't have to use, you know, complicated language. You don't have to say bandhas. You don't have to say, you know, alignment. You don't have to put someone in a yoga pose. I think that you can try to encourage someone, you know, just put their mind in their body and just allow maybe like a moment of, of peacefulness, of restfulness without, you know, because I think like as humans, we're always on to the next thing. We're always on the next thing. So putting yourself in the moment and then really focusing on, you know, what is my body doing in this moment and to be just a little bit more of an active participant in what someone is doing. And so with my clients, I really do try to encourage that during my sessions. And then, you know, what's nice is I can, I can walk, watch them walk or watch them move and we can do this before the session and then I do the treatment and then after the session, we kind of repeat the same things. And now that they've had acupuncture or gua sha or cupping, their body can move in a different way. Often there's more range of motion and there's more freedom of movement so they can really start to feel, you know, the connection and start to, oh, okay, I can, I see what you're saying. When, when I ask them, you know, can you feel your shoulders moving back? Oh yes, I can tell, I can feel that. And I can, I can now like put my mind there into, into keeping my shoulders away from my ears, things like that. As a teacher, is it important for you to, for your students to push themselves? Does it irritate you if they don't, not just yoga, I'm talking about anything you've taught? No, no, that doesn't bother me at all. Yeah, so like you, <laughs> you, 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 um, you perform your duties as the instructor the best way you can, and then let the students kind of figure it out for themselves. I think so. In terms of what their limits are, mm-hmm. I think so, and I think it's that's important for people to to have that space. I always, not always, but I often say in yoga class that I say this is your class, but more importantly, this class is for you. So it's basically a safe, open space for you to, you know, explore where your body's at today. And I think when someone is ready to hear that additional cue, and I always say, you know, I always encourage, you know, push, you know, kick harder, move this, stretch more. But if someone's not ready to hear that, then they're just not ready. Maybe their body's not ready, their mind isn't ready. And that's not up for me to take that as any sort of feedback on me as a teacher. That's just up to, I think, the student's growth and exploration of you know what they're trying to learn when did you decide to after receiving this treatment acupuncture treatment um performing yoga getting back to 
health like to where you wanted to be um what made you want to you know make this transition as a uh, as a healer as a therapist yeah. um in you know from western medicine to chinese medicine did you have that state of mind like transitioning or did you want to just expand your knowledge and kind of use both in the way you work with people well at first it really was i just wanted to learn more about this and during the during this time i was still active duty air force and i just you know i didn't couldn't just take a couple of years off and go to acupuncture school. So I just thought, I just sort of put how it. Long, so how long were you in the Air Force for? I was in the Air Force for 12 years. Wow. Yeah. So I just sort of filed it away in the filing cabinet. And it was like, okay, maybe in the future, I'd like to learn more about this simply because I would like to work on my own health. You know, I was at this time where I had to drive 90 minutes to see an acupuncturist. And I thought, wouldn't it be nice if I could just sort of, you know, work on my own knee, you know, in the living room and, you know, in the evenings, that would be, that'd be kind of cool to do that. Does it have the same effects though? Like you doing it on yourself versus you relaxing and have someone else do it? You know, it's not as pleasant, right? It's, it's always nice, right? To receive acupuncture because you just get to lay down and just and do that. But, you know, it's certainly more convenient <laughs> to work on yourself. But yeah, you know, yeah. If, 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 if my best friend is around, you know, her and I will definitely, you know, trade treatments. I'll work on her. She works on me. So, <laughs> yeah. So I just, I, when I got out of the Air Force, I, I ended up, working as a project manager for a software company. And I, I just didn't, I didn't really connect with the job. You know, I had gone from again, teaching and coaching and I felt really passionate about it. And I was just, I was just sort of doing the job and it was a perfectly fine job at a wonderful company. Off, like an office type yeah, job. Yeah, office corporate type job. Yeah. And it was, it was great, but I just didn't like, I didn't have the same passion for it. And I just, I was just thinking one day, I was like, you know, if I, if I don't, if I don't, try to do something I'm passionate about, then I, I'll probably just be working this job forever. And then I was like, oh yeah, I, I love acu, like I should go to acupuncture school. So that's, I quit my job and I went to yoga teacher training and then I went to acupuncture school. <laughs> did did um, like the people around you, were they supportive? Well, they thought, I thought, they thought I was lost my mind. <laughs> they thought I was bonkers. Like, wait a minute, you're leaving this secure software job for you're going to go to yoga teacher training and then you're going to go to acupuncture school. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, my family, they, they were like, Oh, you know, they thought that this is maybe a phase. I'll just sort of snap yeah. out of it. And but come were back. they, were they aware of the effects that it had on you personally, like how it helped you? They were, but no one else that I really knew had tried it at this yeah. point. So I was, you know, I was sort of the only one and I was like, I had a, a great experience. But I was yep. like, well, that's nice, you know, good for you. But it wasn't like, oh man, we have to try this too. So, so yeah, when I, when I went to school, it was just, you know, everyone's just like, we support you, but you know, I'm sure that you'll come back and ask for your job back later on. <laughs> I How, never did. <laughs> good. How long um, is uh, acupuncture school? How long was it then? It's a four year master's degree. Well. Yeah. Uh, and in Phoenix? Yes, I went to I went to Phoenix Institute of Herbal Medicine and Acupuncture in Phoenix, Arizona. And then as soon as you were done there, you started uh, practicing? Yes, yes. Wow. Um, and from the beginning, did you see, um, like you mentioned, you saw yourself walking through the door yeah. with your patients. Mm -hmm. Like from the beginning, did you have that feeling that, I don't use, like use the word convincing, but like, um, like when someone walks in that you need to not only treat them, but also make them feel comfortable with this maybe strange environment oh, that yeah. they're entering. Oh, yeah. So yeah, for wh sure. what's, the, what's that like? Yeah, you know? the majority of people who come in for a treatment for acupuncture, cupping, whatnot, they've never done this before. It's, you know, perhaps people who've exhausted every other option and then now they're ready to just, fine, I've, I've tried everything else, nothing's worked, maybe you can have a crack at it. Or maybe it's someone who's just curious, maybe a friend or family member. They've seen it advertised on maybe social media or the you know television, something like that. So I I always really try to explain you know the context of what it is I'm doing because I know it's not in our culture and I know it can seem kind of weird and kind of scary. So I always take the time during my initial consultation to you know, very much situate acupuncture within the context. And I, and I set people's expectations and share with them what I'm going to be doing and why I think it would be a really good fit for them. But I'm also, I'm also not afraid to say no either. Like if someone's not a good fit for a modality that I'm offering, I'm, I'm 
you know, I'm happy to refer them to someone who I think is a better fit. Do you, um, as someone who is trained in Western medicine, um, do you see it as an advantage um, that you have that knowledge in your back pocket as well? I think so. Yeah, I definitely think so. Because, you know, um, is it, again, I don't think this is specific to Chinese medicine. Uh, I think it's specific to um, any type of practice out there. Uh, But is it a problem of a lot of charlatans um, in the field that claim to be able to heal people, claim different um, modalities that they practice, um, but in reality they don't really know what they're doing and why they're practicing what they practice? I think that that's probably a risk in like any field, honestly. You know, it's not necessarily like a, a healing modality because acupuncture and Chinese medicine are a licensed profession in the United States. I think that that really when has... When did that come in, by the way? That came around in the in the 80s. Mm-hmm. So what happened was, you know, Richard Nixon went to go visit China in 1971. His press secretary became very ill during the trip and needed an appendectomy. And during the appendectomy, it was done without anesthesia. It was only done using acupuncture for pain relief. And this blew his mind. And he came back to the United States and wrote an article about it. And acupuncture really started to gain a lot of attention. And then I think during that time period from like the early 70s through the 80s, there were a lot of, you know, maybe charlatans or people who just didn't know. And so they were sort of riding the the coattails of, you know, hey, acupuncture, it's really, it's really cool. Like, give it a shot. And then, you know, as it became more of a recognized profession where you have to sit for board exams and you have to attend an accredited school, that has made way for acupuncture and in Chinese medicine in particular to become a more respected profession where you, you know, you really, when you're, when you're going to someone, it's easy to look up your practitioner on the national board website to see if your practitioner is nationally board certified. It's easy to know if your practitioner has a state license. So, you know, you have, as a consumer, you have a lot more information at your fingertips to know whether or not you're dealing with an accredited person or not. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about gua sha. Yeah. Um, it's also obviously something we discussed a yeah. lot the last couple of days. I love gua sha. Yeah. So where, where was your introduction to gua sha? So you learn gua sha in, in acupuncture school. And so is gua sha, does it have a connection to the principles of acupuncture? It does. Yes, it does. So traditional Chinese medicine or Chinese medicine is sort of the umbrella term. And under that umbrella, there are several different modalities that can be used in order to carry out what we would consider to be Chinese medicine. And those modalities are acupuncture, cupping, gua sha, moxibustion, and herbal medicine. And you, so you learn all of that? You learn all of those in in acupuncture Mm. college and, and how to use and select each one and apply that appropriately during a treatment in order to in order to achieve an intended, intended outcome. And gua sha, so for those who don't know, uh, mm-hmm. like I, le- most of what I know about gua sha, I learned in the last 24 hey, hours from great. you. <laughs> um, but so for those who don't know, um, what is gua sha? W- w- why is it practiced? And, is it, also, and it also stems from um, ancient Chinese medicine. It does. It stems from ancient Chinese medicine. In fact, it's thought that the practice of gua sha is is considerably older than the practice of acupuncture. Acupuncture comes from what was thought to be the Neolithic era, the Stone Age. Gua sha was thought to come from the old Stone Age, the Paleolithic era. And it was thought that, you know, if people started to feel sick or became unconscious, then stones or bone or horn was rubbed on the skin in order to restore consciousness or to restore health. So that's sort of where the idea of it's called frictioning traditionally or, you know, rubbing something across the skin in order to to do something for for the for the health of the body. And in terms of how you how you apply gua sha, you apply gua sha, you know, anywhere in the body and for many different reasons. So it works in tandem with with acupuncture or with cupping, but it also can be a standalone treatment as well. Nutrition mm-hmm. is a you know you mentioned herbal remedies. Um, can I can I Please. Can put that under nutrition as yep. well? Mm-hmm. So uh, nutrition is an important component then of Chinese medicine. Yes. Um, and you see also like you know I, I maybe because I'm interested in these things I get a lot of um, ads now on, on online for different herbs from different places oh, and yes. uh, yep. that I can order all these different teas and all these different mm-hmm. pills even. 
um, so what is what is different than what you know how we approach um, in the Western world, how we approach nutrition, um, and why again why does it seem so strange? Because everything, correct me if I'm wrong, in the Chinese world when it comes to new, to these um, herbal remedies, it's all natural things that um, we should you know that are at arm's reach for us as well in the Western world. Um, so why are we so um, creeped out by it? <laughs> well, I think it's not in our culture, um, for one. I also think that there's a level of complexity involved with nutrition or what we would consider, it's called Chinese dietary therapy. And because it is part of Chinese medicine, it respects, again, this holistic nature of the body. But within that, it, it really highlights that no two people are the same, that everything is should be done with an eye towards respecting an individual's, their own constitution and their own body. So with that being said, there's no such thing as one diet that can be prescribed to everyone. So, you know, like we love fad diets, you know, especially in this country, you know, keto or paleo, you know, these big umbrellas of things. But Chinese dietary therapy is not like that. It's truly individual and a dietary recommendation or an herbal recommendation that you would give to one person could be completely inappropriate for another person. So I think we don't really see a lot of it or we may be a little bit resistant to it because you you kind of have to submit yourself to someone who works within, you know, Chinese medicine in order to first understand what your constitution is and then develop a plan for what it is that you should be doing. So what techniques do you use to re- read a person? Um, we, you know, we did speak about like the, you know, speaking to an individual, mm-hmm. um, asking you know, about their lives, yes. sleeping mm-hmm. habits, food habits, that type of thing. But what else, what type of body scans would you do? Yeah. On an individual? Like I, I know when, I, when, when, from my experience, mm-hmm. and again, we, we, we also showed this today was a, t- like a tongue, tongue. scan, mm-hmm. um, feeling my heartbeat in different parts of the body, yep. mm-hmm. um, Those are the main two I remember in terms of like physical um, Mm -hmm. um, examinations. Yeah. So those are those are probably the most two popular is is tongue diagnosis and pulse diagnosis. So, again, you know, Chinese medicine is very old. There was no way to, you know, you can't take blood or run a lab, you know, thousands of years ago. So this system of healing and diagnosis evolved on clinical observation of patients. So you ask questions And then anything that is showing up on the exterior of the body is thought to be indicative of the health of the interior of the body. So anything that comes out of the body, sweat, fluid, tears, urine, feces, all of that is very indicative of the state of health in the body. You can also feel the pulses. And unlike Western pulse, you know, if someone's just feeling your pulse at your doctor's office, they're just, you know, sort of feeling for your heart rate. There are six different pulse positions where you're feeling at three different levels of the skin. And those are very indicative of all sorts of different things going on with the body. And pulse diagnosis is is complicated and it takes several years of practice to really understand that. You can look at the tongue and the tongue is thought to be a microcosm of the interior of the body. And I I like to call them Chinese x-rays because you can really, it's like an x-ray. You can really see exactly what's going on in the body. You can look at the ears. The ears are really indicative of the health, the overall health of the body. So this... What's what's with the ears? Like, because a tongue uh, tongue can change colors. Yep, um, colors, shape, moisture, moisture, all that thing. Yeah. So ears? Ears are kind of cool. So I encourage you and listeners to take a look at your ear in the mirror. And your ear is called a homunculus, which means it is a homologous structure to a human. So if you look at your ear in the mirror, it looks like an upside down human baby. Yeah. So with like the head being down at the lobe and then the spine is represented by, you know, the outside of the ear. So it's sort of like it looks like a spine. And then up at the top of the ear where things start to split, those represent like the arms and the legs. And then the interior of the ear represent the internal organs. And ears are very diagnostic. No two ears are the same. Um, Some ears have, you know, veins or discoloration, darkness, lightness, 
redness, really paleness. So certain areas of the ears where that shows up is indicative of what's going on in that particular part of the body. The size of ears have a, have a yeah, uh, it, does it indicate anything? Well, traditionally in Chinese medicine, ears are associated <laughs> with... <laughs> I'm asking because you know, if, there's, if there's one part of my body that I am super proud of, that I tell people that I, that I can say that in my opinion is, is perfect... <laughs> I think my ears. I don't think they've changed since I'm like in sixth grade. Their size, now they're covered. But they're, but they're, and they're also covered with my hair. But size wise, I think they're just, just right. Yeah. Ears are, <laughs> are connected with the kidney system in Chinese medicine. That in the kidney is the foundational system of the body. And if you have big ears, the bigger ear, the better. And especially oh ear lobe. If you ever look at like statues of, of Buddha, Buddha statues, the big ear lobes, the long ear lobes associated with long, healthy life. So mm. big ears, Chinese medicine is, is good. Big stuff. ear lobes or big ears? <laughs> big ears with long ear lobes. Oh, man. It's the ideal healthy ear. <laughs> wow. Okay. So, okay. So here's a question to yeah. you. So like, I think I have pretty small ears. Um, <laughs> so if I... Yeah, make a, a certain transformation if I need to, to a more balanced life, a better structured life and whatever it is to restore my mm -hmm. ideal health, yeah. will my ears grow? No, then? no, no, no. Your ears no? won't grow. No. So it'd be a little bit more on the other side of it. It would just be so, for example, you know, if you have maybe like small, delicate ears with, you know, smaller earlobes, like maybe the cartilage of your ears aren't very, you know, it's not very good. Then what you would say is instead of, your ears might grow if you change your life, you would say, look, you may have a predisposition to having, you know, just a little bit of a deficiency in this particular area. So mm. you ought to be careful of that in the future and make sure that you, you know, eat this certain way and, you know, live your life in this certain way because you just might have a constitutional predisposition to a weakness or a deficiency in this particular area. So interesting. Yeah, I can't make your ears grow. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's fine. No, no, I'm happy. I'm, so I said, like I said, I'm really happy the way um, with their size. Um, one thing also I heard you say earlier was um, the connection between I, I don't know if you use is a gut, um, uh, something in the stomach with knee pain, like associating. Um, does that ring a bell? I think we were talking a little bit about uh, like low back and knee pain. Mm, so maybe I have that I have that wrong, but I thought it, I thought it, I heard you say some connection between uh, either stomach, gut. Um... Oh yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So, Am I? Okay. So the stomach Good. meridian, <laughs> the stomach meridian, which passes along the anterior of the body, also follows the lateral side of the knee. So that would be a dysfunction. We would consider that a dysfunction of that stomach meridian system would be that lateral knee pain. And you most often see, you know, like a little bit of digestive stuff might show up there too. You know, some mm. just might be a little bit predisposed to that. So what, are, what is the importance of these meridians uh, that, that go like, all around the body? And it's different like, because uh, mm -hmm. um, um, there's a lot of them, right? Yes. Um, yes. And we use the model here to, uh, Michael, to uh, <laughs> to really d demonstrate them. And mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's pretty fascinating. It um, is fascinating. So, but, 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 you know, it's, it's, uh, it's someone who's untrained. It's tough like, to see the connection between the stomach and the lateral part of the knee. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So we would first have to look at, you know, we have these organ systems in the body, which are, you know, they're, they're groupings of different functionality because, again, there's no way to look inside the body. So we have a stomach organ, but really that's not a specific tissue. It's a grouping of functions, right? So the stomach in Chinese medicine is responsible for certain things, mainly like, you know, taking in food and transporting it to a different part of the body, things like that, right? So the stomach does have a digestive function, but we also have a stomach meridian and that meridian can be seen as a three-dimensional passageway or a sphere of influence of that stomach tissue group or that stomach organ group. So that's because the stomach meridian traverses not only in the stomach, but also along the knee and also passes along the face. Then that's why we can see that there's a connection between, you know, perhaps a digestive concern, perhaps a little bit of a weakness in the outside of the knee, maybe, you know, something going on with the eyes or the gums, things like that. So that's why, you know, if we see like bleeding gums, that's usually an indication that there's an issue going on in the stomach because of the meridian connection. The stomach meridian goes up to the upper gums. Chinese medicine, you also mentioned that there's a separated school of thought, school of practice that is more 
um, about the balance of wood, fire, yeah, water. Mm-hmm. Can we talk about yeah, that a little sure. bit? Yeah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, So is that separate from what you've studied and what you practice, or is it involved in your in yours in your life as well? It's in it's it's involved. So I learned that type of of diagnosis and treatment at the same time that I learned, you know, what I consider traditional Chinese medicine or classical Chinese medicine and what you're referring so to. It's, so it's a form, sorry, but it's a, so it's a form of, I just want to misspeak. Uh, so it's a form of uh, diagnosis and treatment mm-hmm. that is separated. That has separated because it has different philosophical underpinnings than TCM. So instead of looking at, you know, this Taoist cosmology of, you know, this yin and yang paradigm where you're trying to put the yin and yang of the cosmos into the yin and yang of the body. What you're referring to is often called five element or five phase theory. And it's thought that there are five phases in the, in the world, uh, wood, fire, metal, earth, and water. And because all of these phases or elements exist in the world, they also exist in the body and you diagnose and treat according to those five phases or five elements. So it's just a little bit of a different, it's a different philosophy in, in looking at the body as opposed to yin and yang. So again, sorry if I'm challenging you and putting you here on the spot, yeah, but, you, but you mentioned that I, by looking at me, mm-hmm. um, that I'm wood, wood, wood woody, you have a wood, wood, wood face, a wood face. <laughs> <laughs> so, I have, so I have a wood face. Mm-hmm. Um, so does that, like so, that, walking into your clinic, um, seeing my face, mm-hmm. um, classifying me as having a wood face. Yeah. Um, so, does that help you? When does that set the tone for when you're checking out my pulse or my tongue? Sure. Um, in a different way than if I had a water face yeah, or absolutely. a fire face. Absolutely. Um, does it indicate anything about my personality? Yes. What would you what would, what would you say? <laughs> so a wood personality. I so hope that's good. Yeah, yeah. No, it's like I already know. I, sh- I should have shut up about my ears because yeah. you, now you made me worried about my ears. <laughs> There's no such thing as as good or bad, right? It's just it's just a category. Is what it is, yeah. yeah, it is what it is. And so what you're looking for is that each element is prone to particular imbalances. So that's all it means, right? Mm. So for so example, also like the ears, you like said the ears. That, yeah. right? you're prone to particular imbalances. Mm. So so you having a very wood structure of your face. And we I knew that because you have a very strong brow and that's a very indicative feature of a wood type of face. Um, the, the imbalance would be um, perhaps a little bit prone to overworking, working too hard. Uh, wood types tend to be very goal oriented, right? But you want to guard against the goal being everything and the only thing and, you know, too much work, too much just focus on doing this one thing, right? And that's why, you know, you kind of have that furrow in your brow, right? Because you you have this hard line of focus, which is a really good thing, right? Having having goals and working towards goals and being focused and driven in that area is is great, right? But you want to just not focus too much on that one thing because that can be, you know, excessive in one direction. And then, um, you know, also wood types can be a little bit prone to maybe being uh, easily irritated or, you know, easily angered when they're a little bit out of balance. So, you know, we would just, we would, we would target your treatment towards, you know, sort of making sure that your wood element feels nice and smooth and, you know, no sharp edges, just everything feels like, okay, good. I can focus. I can be clear. I, you know, I'm not really feeling irritated or angry about anything right now. <laughs> M- makes sense. Yeah. Um, what are you? Metal. Metal. Mm-hmm. I have what, a very what, classically metal face. <laughs> what does uh, metal indicate? Uh, metal indicates structure. It's the last one I'll ask you Yeah, about. no, no. I'll, it's I'll let the people read about the remaining three. Yeah. Right? It's five of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Metal, uh, metal is all about structure and linear progression. So you can think of, you know, like an actual piece of metal, like a sword, right? So metal likes linear things, you know, and I do. I, I love logic. I love philosophy. I love, you know, I love structure. I love regiment. That's why I love Bikram yoga, right? I love Ashtanga yoga because it's a series. You know, I love the structure. I love showing up every day and working in the structure. I was in the military, right? I love, I love structure. But for me, I have to guard against being too obsessed with structure, right? So like if I, if I, my only goal is like, I I just want the structure. I just, you know, have to do everything by the textbook, right? So I can get, you know, acupuncture school, everyone, you know, everyone made fun of me, right? Because I was like, it has to be by the textbook. (laughs) Right. So that, that's a very classically metal trait is that, you know, you like structure, but you know, you don't want everything. You just don't want to obsess about structure and linearity all the time. (laughs) For the skeptics out there, um, is there a book, a couple books that you recommend um, just to maybe help p- 
people that are, you know, because I think it's completely normal to be skeptical about yeah. everything yeah, we just we discussed. Yeah, as we should um, be. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> um, so are there a couple of um, books you recommend maybe to read that will help people connect to it, understand better in our terms of westernized culture? Yeah, I really like a book called uh, The Web That Has No Weaver by a gentleman named Ted Kapchuk. And that see the Harvard professor. He's a Harvard professor. Yeah. Yes, he he really lays out all of the main tenets of Chinese medicine in a nice way. That's sort of the first half of the book, and the second half of the book, he gives a nice view into looking at the body as patterns, various patterns that creep up, patterns of disharmony. And you know, you can if you if you allow that book to sort of give you a good insight into into Chinese medicine, I think that that's a wonderful way to start and it's pretty easily accessible. In terms of five element theory, I like a book that's called Wood Becomes Water and it teaches you all about all of these five phases or five elements and how they're present and you know turning into each other and supporting each other in the, the world at large and also turning into each other and supporting each other in the body and how we can look for these certain physical attributes and traits and how that informs, you know, the health and wellness of our body. I just have to ask you because that the, the second title of the book that you mentioned, Wood Becomes Water. Mm -hmm. So because of the connection to me being a wood, <laughs> um, so why, why the title Wood Becomes Water? That's a, that's a great question. So everything begins with water in five element theory. So water exists to start with and then water becomes wood. And you can think of this in our environment like it rains and then water, a tree grows. So water becomes wood. And the next phase is fire. So perhaps there's a forest fire and then fire you know, burns the wood. And then it all burns down to the next phase, which is earth. So everything continues to burn, turns to ash, and then now we have the earth phase. The next phase is metal. And we can see that you know, metal or minerals are what we pull out of the earth. And we're starting to go deeper down into the earth here. And then finally, everything condenses and turns back into water. So all of the completion of the five phases is wood, therefore going back and turning into water. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, Dr. Constance Bradley, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, um, Danny. It's can great. you please tell people where they can find um, your content online, your teachings online, um, where your practice is? Um, obviously, your, your the online courses that we produced here will be mm -hmm. uh, live sometime in the next uh, a few weeks, couple of months. Uh, super excited about them. Um, really, it's our first um, introduction. You're helping us uh, really introduce our audience and um, the listeners here to acupuncture to gua sha to traditional chinese medicine so i personally hope to explore this further i'll read um definitely i'll start definitely start with all right, uh, all right. wood I'll, becomes water i'll bring you a test next time <laughs> <laughs> um i'll be ready for it um so yeah so please tell people where they can uh, find you and then we'll wrap this up yeah absolutely so you can find me online i'm at drconstancebradley.com i'm also on social media at drconstancebradley and I have a practice in Louisville, Kentucky, as well as I practice in Scottsdale, Arizona. You can find all the information more about me. And I offer online trainings as well as in-person trainings. You can find out all of that on my website. Phenomenal. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you liked this video and you want to see more, make sure to subscribe below and don't forget to hit the notification button.